Are we live? Great. Okay, here we go. Uh, are you ready? So, um, I'm Matt Brandt, uh, one of the web QAs with Mozilla. And I'm very pleased to um, present to you Shmuel Gershon uh, from uh, Intel's Jerusalem campus. He's going to speak today um, a bit about exploratory testing and session-based testing, and then a, a bit about a tool that, that he, he offered. Um, no, it's actually open source. We'll have links posted. Uh, but, but to help himself and his team um, in their testing endeavors. Um, very pleased to give you over to Shmuel. Yeah. Hi. Um, First of all, thank you. I didn't, let's see if we'll have applause at the end. And, uh, okay, so I, I'm very happy to be here. I think I'm, even more I'm proud to be here, which is selfish, but I think it's also nice to hear. Uh, thanks to Matt for inviting me. Uh, I just met, met him face to face very recently. We knew each other on it in the web. And a great guy, very creative into coming with some things for talking, and thanks Mozilla for Hosting me, this is a very unusual opportunity, like being invited to talk. Usually I ask to talk and people just ignore me. So, it's, so this is really uh, a different uh, uh, experience for me. And Matt promised me that uh, this can be a, a, a conversation. So uh, as you'll see, I don't have more than a rough out outline of what I want to cover here. So you are welcome to ask questions and direct the talk to any different ways I, I can adapt. And I, I will not have answers for everything, but I'll have more questions for any question that you'll be able to come up. So we should be good, good at that. Uh, this is more or less what we'll, what we'll cover a little bit of you on, on exploration and on session based. I'll tell a short, maybe short stories of how we do that uh, at Intel there. Uh, and I'll present this this tool uh, for you too. So, let's see. Let's I don't have content, so you have a title and I will speak the content out. Uh, I believe uh, Matt invited me because I have a particular view on software testing. But by particular, I don't mean that it's special or it's different. Uh, actually, my views are shared by uh, many of the members of the community. Uh, I, I refer to this particular because it's a personal view that uh, fits my uh, personal philosophy. Uh, borrowed from different sources and different books and, uh, and many people that I've met. Uh, on the, I've been working as, uh, as a tester, receiving money for tests for the last six years, all, all of them at Intel Corporation. Uh, and I did tests before that, but I was a programmer. Uh, I just, I didn't know that I liked, I didn't notice that I liked more to test the things that I wrote than to write them. Uh, but I, I did a very poor job because I, I was very biased by my own programming. But for five years before starting to test, I worked as a programmer in, for many different types of software, uh, writing software in different types of languages, uh, uncomfortable languages like C, uncomfortable ones like Delphi. Uh, I think this is a, a this is an interesting distinction for languages. Like, uh, I don't really much care about the technical aspects of the languages, but I think there are languages that are uncomfortable, like uh, assembly, uncomfortable, like PHP. Even if you don't like PHP, they are comfortable because you can just have things written very big. Um, and uh, I am uh, uh, focusing on these aspects of programming because I come to Mozilla with a uh, big prejudice about how Mozilla works. And I want to have an answer here to one question. Uh, I view many companies are, uh, they come with an objective of providing a product or a service. So, and I see Mozilla as having the objective of producing code. That's, that's the essence of it. It's a big open source company. Uh, so I, I have a prejudice of, and I want to know how focused or biased towards code and automation is Mozilla. In your view, compared to other places, you can answer it. No one else. You have to answer more questions. <laughs> very, very well. So, let's um, say we have a very thick automation strategy. Although QA is, is in the process of catching up with it to some degree, 
um, unit testing strategy at Mozilla is uh, excellent. I think, you know, probably it's done a huge amount for our, our code stability over the last couple of years since it's been adopted. Um, as far as product automation goes, uh, that's still in the way. I mean, we're, we're building, I think, web is a little bit ahead of product in that regard. But uh, there's definitely a focus on it in our team and other ones. Okay, so uh, for the answer that I I'll summarize the parts that are important for me. I, I see that there is a big uh, automation going on outside the real product. So a lot of parallel coding things going on, and you say that the testing is still trying to catch up with that. Right? That's more or less what I said. And I don't see anyone disagreeing. So that, that's what I believe. Mean. So uh, I was uh, somewhat uh, guessing that there is like this feeling that the testing here had to catch up with automation because that's what all the rest of the company is doing with a company of coders and uh, source code they take a lot of value here. Uh, that's what uh, Mozilla came up. Uh, so I'll take this point of automation to start to explain how I do testing and I would like to have discussion if, with anything you don't agree. Uh, so I'll tell one story, a short story of uh, something that happened uh, with us at Intel, and I hope I don't disclose secrets, otherwise <laughs> I'll be killed as, as soon as I left the building. And uh, we, we had one pilot, uh, one project where we did all the tests based on exploration, all manual, uh, no test runs uh, before that, and using sessions that we will cover in a while. And one part of this pilot had uh, interface with many, many different uh, components and platforms. We work a lot related to the hardware that we work in. And to the extent that uh, the testers uh, felt they would not be able to cover all of them if they try it manually. Uh, as much as I come from a programming background, I did not uh, encourage them to, to do this automatically. And the tester requested them to say, let's, do, let's build a, uh, something to simulate different interfaces that we have here and just have this automated in at least one after the other. And I, I, I didn't believe in that very much. And I, as in not to do that, I preferred to have the feeling of the real product instead of building stubs and locks in the process. And, and I'm very happy that he proved me wrong. Uh, he insisted, he said, after he started manually, he said, there's much more here than we can cover. I will do a, an automation and he spent a few days writing it. And he really proved me wrong. We found many, many, many bugs and many problems. Uh, the other parts of the product, uh, programmers and managers are happy with finding bugs with automation. It's, uh, so I was wrong in that part, but I was happy that we uh, let our first exploration and our first feeling determine that we wanted to automate that thing, instead of just knowing that, oh, this is something we can automate, so let's automate that before we are sure that we need. And the second thing that makes me more proud, I think, of the automation is that it's just, it, it only run, run twice. The first time when it found the bugs, and the second time after the bugs were fixed to verify it. We never, uh, as far as I know, the automation state again. Uh, which is not what usually happens, but we, we let the automation suite that is available because we are used to think that it's very cheap. Okay, it's there, just press enter, it will happen. So we, we did not let it direct what kind of test we want to do just because it's there and it's a low hanging fruit, or we could think of that. Uh, the automation was there and we had uh, we had possibility of automate more or less and we had this part automated. But still we we all the time we decided what kind of automation are we trying to get now and that uh, directed us to decide when we want to build or run the automation and when we don't run it. So because we didn't saw any risk of having different information from running the automation again, we didn't run the automation again even if, if it would be cheap. Right? Because even if it's a very small time to run it, in this small time I can do something completely new with the product and discover something that I didn't know before. Even if it's something good, even if I just try something and the product still works, so I know about another part of the product that has no bugs in it. Uh, and so, so from, from this view of automation, I can like, feel how, how we how we approach testing in a whole. Uh, and when I say that we, I mean my closer testing team. Intel is very big and each, 
every 10 persons will work completely different. So, I mean, my closing test, I think that's how we approach. We try to make uh, it as manual as possible, because manual is more adaptive, and by manual, you don't have, you are open for unexpected things. Uh, I would like to argue that testing is discovering. We try to discover new things. And the new things can be good things and can be bad things. Can be parts of the problem that work, parts of the problem that do not work. And and if we are trying to answer the same question that we answered uh, yesterday or on the test cycle, then we're not discovering new things. And we may be feeling well because we have a lot of activity going on. And and then we can start counting the activities speeds in test cases, speeds in hours of tests, or, or numbers, numbers of plots, usually new things. But if we are running something just to get, and we know that we will get the same information, then we are missing there a, a point of what testing we are getting. Uh, and, and the summary of my talk also talked about teams. And uh, what, when, when you uh, focus on automation, uh, you already come with a very, very clear uh, view of what you expect from the test you do. So, because you have to tell the computer what to pay attention and what not to pay attention. Uh, you cannot just... <laughs> Otherwise, you have to, to watch it as he does the test and check all the logs and try to find unexpected things. But when you write anything that is as much scripted as to be able to automate that to a, a, to a computer, you have to tell the computer exactly what to look for. And you're not open to look for another things. And that's really uh, reduces the collaboration that happens. Because when you don't know what to expect, then you talk. Uh, I, I wake up late today morning. Uh, uh, you don't care about it. But there was a house was, uh, on the TV, the TV series. And then I just noticed that uh, whenever they get stuck, and even a house, when he gets stuck, then he talks with people. That does what happen when you don't, you are not, you are not sure what to expect next, and that's what happened when, when you are faced with some ambiguity, so it can be lupus, it cannot be lupus, you don't know, so it just gathers everyone and start talking about it. Uh, the same thing will happen when you test. If you uh, narrow the kind of things that we expect, because you have to tell to the computer that are very dumb, unless you use Intel processors, but usually they, they are not so smart, and, and you have to tell them essentially what to expect, and you reduce the ambiguity to a level where the program can really run in a smooth way, then you don't talk. I mean, and testers, uh, especially if they know how to code, will come less and less to programmers to talk about what are the options here, and wh wh what could be different. Uh, they don't think about what can be different. In fact, testers will expect things not to be never different, because at the moment it's, it's different. They'll have to rewrite all the automation again, and that's a very hard job. No one likes to work hard. So, so, uh, so I, I, I don't want to diss automation. Automation is very good, and as I said, I, because of my disencouragement uh, uh, of automation, I almost made uh, my team to miss a big part of the bugs that were in this last project. So, so I learned to like automation more. Uh, but I'm very afraid of uh, automation or uh, script testing when you do it manually without thinking of taking from the value that a testing team and a whole development team can have uh, from both sides. I don't know here who, who tests and who uh, tests. You mean? I forgot. She tests. She tests. She tests, she does. And are there programmers here? You, you do both? You program as a tester? Software engineering tester. Oh, so yeah, usually most programmers don't come when, when there's title testing in, in the <laughs> when the, the, it's writing testing in the title of the talk, so next time you have to not tell anyone it's testing, and then they will come, they will be surprised. So, uh, but the idea is that, that uh, uh, programmers, they, they start to see value as they start getting questions about things they, they haven't thought before. And, and these questions come from uh, uh, unclear positions. So there's a lot of ambiguity uh, when we talk about software. You cannot even, if, we go to the utopia of uh, having the requirements of front very clear. You cannot try the things that we mentioned in, in a good way. Uh, and the more you deal with that and try to think about these things even before you start using the product, for a scripted test or for an automation of tests, then the less questions you have. And so everybody is stuck on the same 
kind of thinking, uh, improvements don't get the value of the, the, the testing team can give to them, and neither do managers. Uh, that, that's our most, like, the, the utmost client that we have. Right? We need to provide information to, to managers, information they don't have, and then they can decide of, okay, we will release, we will not release. Uh, I don't know how, uh, uh, how this is taken differently here, this community or not community. If the community helps decide on that. It could be interesting to see, to see if the community does the community outside Mozilla knows the results of the test before release? They can see them. Whether they're actually looking at them, I think, is a much different question. Oh, but they can see them. Mm -hmm. If they're run through our test case management system. Yeah. So and that's the application system that's is also public based. Okay, congratulations to Mozilla on that. That's a very transparent way transparent of working. So <coughs> it's also interesting because if, like, if we provide the service to the, to the community, then the community can see the testing and say, okay, we are fine with not releasing uh, Firefox 5 on time because we saw that very nasty bug was there. That's enough decision not to release because the testing will not have this decision. Neither do programmers, but management can take this information and decide. Management cannot take uh, information uh, usually, like at least of, of, of numbers or color charts and decide based on them. Like, uh, any of the Usually, metrics don't provide any information on the risk that the product has, but stories do. So, uh, when there is when there are questions happening that uh, usually no one knows the answer. So, okay, what should we do in that case? What what the program should do? And programmers will not know anyway. They just decide. Uh, they fill the blanks that the requirements give by by themselves until someone asks why these and not something else. And then management management start noticing what questions are still open. And then they can, they, they can have a good idea to decide whether to fix or not. So, a couple of uh, quick things before you move on to exploratory. You touched on a couple things with automation. There was one thing that you said uh, sort of in passing, but I wanted to highlight it, which is that you mentioned that automation has to be very focused on what it looks for. And I've seen an anti-pattern on both sides of that. One is that you're looking for very focused things and management or whoever assumes that this takes the place of testing, which I'm sure is not to be the of your talk. But the other is that they try to make the automation too expansive and look at everything, and that drives your maintenance up into the sky uh, because it becomes very, very fragile. But the other thing I, I just wanted to ask, um, you mentioned automation and its use. You know, standard automation tends to tilt towards regression style tests, at least the stuff that you have in QA. Unit tests as well are basically regression tests. I don't see those so much as bug finding things, although I recognize your automation, you have a lot of luck with that. Um, I see those as basically assuring that you can move faster in the process. It's giving you some level of confidence that you can move forward without double checking every cross T and dotted I. Obviously, it's not perfect, but, but that's where I see the main use of it to be. And I was just curious what your feeling on that was. Yeah, we're just taking notes like address. I have a note here. Uh, speak, talk into the mic, repeat the question. So, I will do both now. Uh, your name is? Jill? Jill. Jill. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Jill asked uh, about two things about automation. First, about uh, uh, why I speak about automation with, with, uh, on being a very focused thing. Uh, that has a very narrow set of things that it can check or not. And the second thing is uh, uh, whether we really have to look at automation about uh, as a, if we come back, as a discovery activity instead of just being something that makes us feel secure and safe about whatever is happening under the hood. Uh, and both are good questions. Uh, I'll answer them separate. Uh, you can be less narrow and more broad when you have an automation. And I'm trying to think how to answer. I may just say I don't know, but I, I think I, I, I have a feeling of what I want to answer. And uh, I'll, I'll bring a, an example. Of, uh, uh, there's a tester called Michael Bolton. He was, was trained, say, talking about something very similar. And he asked me, uh, let's say I'm on a bar, and I ask, we'll do it just for a, 
uh, bottle of uh, Stella Artois uh, beer. And she brings the bottle to me. So, is that okay? Is that, is that fine? So, so uh, do we have a problem here? She brought the bottle. But maybe, maybe it's empty. Right? So we may have a problem here. So let's say she brings the bottle and the bottle is full. Uh, are we fine or do we have a problem here? I don't know, maybe it's water instead of beer. So let's say it's beer. Maybe it's hot, so I don't want to be hot. So let's say it's cold, maybe it's a different beer inside the bottle. And let's say it's stellar coin and it's cold, maybe it's past the expiration. And so you can, uh, you can uh, start to broaden the, the types of things you tell your automation to, 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 to look at. But you can never tell the automation just to look for problems. Right? Okay, okay. You receive a packet back, now check, think of if there is any problem here. That can be anywhere in the time it's, it took for the packet to come back, or in the, in the content of the packet, or if there was a, a packet was repeated and came again after a few seconds. So a tester can do that without you telling him to do that. So a tester automatically will have, a, if he is, if no one took that from him, he will automatically will look at the things that are outside and no one told him. So that you can do that with automation. You, you, even if you broaden, you still have a very narrow focus compared to everything that could be there. Uh, so, so when you try an automation of discovery, you never have as much discovery as you could if you had someone trying that manually. And when you don't look at automation as a scope, and you do, like you said, a regression test, then uh, that's, sometimes it can be valuable or not. Uh, we have to be careful with, uh, with this feeling of uh, how secure we want. And as I said, I, I borrow my, my the, the things I think from other people. So I don't mention, there's a, another guy called Brian Merrick, who wrote a paper on one to automate test. And he starts the paper saying, uh, uh, what if, I run a set of tests now and everything is looking now fine and I don't have anything automated and so a few months from now things change and I'm not able to, unless I try to start to do it, everything manually again, I don't have a way to run them automatically and I don't know if they are still testing and he goes there, uh, will I not feel terrible uh, that I'm missing this coverage now? And he realized that the, our, that our objective is not feeling well, right? <laughs> Sometimes we have to feel terrible uh, with fear of having missed something there if it's really not valuable to, to look at that. And, and there are companies, uh, even big, uh, harder construction companies uh, somewhere in the world where <laughs> that I can't mention, where uh, regression tests and knowing that there is a whole lot of activity going on that brings uh, repeated results over and over again every week uh, makes people feel better. So, okay, yeah, I don't know, we, we may have something hidden there uh, in places that we haven't go, we haven't tried yet, but at least things that we tried are still just as we tried. And it's like having a, the babies that have a blanket and, okay, I will hold to these test results and I want them every day at the morning to see them over and over again and green. And as soon as they are green, I'll, I'll feel safe, even though they might be monsters somewhere else in the program. So, I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying it's dangerous. Uh, I don't know, I can say, I, I will not say never do that, I will not say do that every time. I just think we have to be careful of trying to feel uh, well with, the, with having results that are repeated, if, if they are not really dangerous, and we just do that to have a big activity. So if you talk about testing as discovery, um, it seems more valuable to have people moving on past things that you have already been through and discovered. Um, so if the waitress brings you a bottle of Stella and it's empty the first time and you add an automated test for that so you know it's never going to be empty again, then your tester doesn't have to worry about that. Your, your tester can take their mental energy and focus on other things. And if, if it comes back with water, then you add an automated test and it's never water again. Um, and that's how we do a lot of our testing in our, I mean, I'm a little bit more and in our test we focus a lot on 
okay, we found this, and now it's never going to slip in again because we've had a regression test for it that we didn't have coverage. Um, so that works with, that, that's using exploration and exploratory testing to help build the automated suite. And you're right, it's not going to discover new issues, but it takes away all of the mental burden of checking for the things that have been discovered. So in that way, it's the exploratory what about, testing builds. What about change? I mean, one of the key things about automation is change the tech. You know, just to, to know that your, your code base has changed in terms of behavior. So you, you get not, notified of that. And then, it, it, I wouldn't say you never test it in that area again. No, but yeah, I mean, to your specific point, I would say that the, the danger is that they never look to see if it's half full. They assume that the test has a wider scope than it does. And I think that's exactly where you were going with that is that it's, that's the danger. People don't understand that automation is very limited scope as a general rule. And I think that one of our jobs as testers, specifically as automation engineers, is to communicate loudly upwards exactly what the tests are covering to the extent that we can, and not give people a sense of false security. But, but to your point, I think it's, uh, you can plan your testing, you know, with a little bit of uh, knowledge about what the automation program and maybe more, you know, knowing what it covers, and then you know doing prioritization. Because I would cover like, let's say, you know, the, the new stuff as opposed to the you know the old stuff that let's say is covered by the, the automation. You, you, you know that uh, so if I want to have time, I only test the new stuff. Right. And, and so I guess. Yeah, I'm trying to use. I'm trying to say we use automation to remove like if stuff has changed or if stuff is new, then yes, it needs. Be a prioritized attention of somebody <laughs> doing it manually. If it's not changed, it's not new. And, and we just, you know, we're using the. True. I mean, and, and I guess it, it, it depends, you know, just how much you trust, you know, those tests. You know, because Geo brings up a good point. There's uh, there's lots, you know, there's. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, shade testing that a bottle is not empty is not the same as testing that it's full, right? Like writing, bad, writing a bad test doesn't do anything. True. I've seen a lot of bad tests. Yeah, we should. Yeah, <laughs> not your specific reason. I'll try to speak into the mic and the questions. So I'll try to summarize for people at home. I know that at least my wife is there. And I don't know how, how many other people have online. But so we had a comment about uh, automation being uh, useful when built in an incremental way just to uh, to save testers from doing some tests. And then we, it was mentioned as, as an additional counterpoint about the danger of uh, the false security that it can give not only to managers, like I mentioned before, but that is a very good point. It gives a false sense of security to the testers that, okay, someone else is looking at here, this robot, and I don't need to. But, uh, but this is a good thing that happens. Uh, like, if things need to be repeated, sometimes it is useful to automate. Uh, when you have Complete chain code. So we start, I don't have an idea to rewrite five from scratch on this scratch, but uh, you have a complete uh, rewrite of a program, then it may be useful to have something that will look at something that everybody knows that have to be looked there. The testers will look anyway, but you receive fast feedback from that. That's a good thing. We, we have our, our um, uh, the product I test is embedded software, it runs on the chipset, on the motherboard. And so every time you have a different motherboard, much of it uh, has to be rewritten to comply with the new hardware limitations or the new hardware capabilities. So automated tests on these models are very useful. Uh, for the rest of the year, whenever we are running the same automated, automated test again, it's just for to feel well and not to get it, like, information from there. And I'm not over the other point, so I think are there more questions on this, on this, all this text? Uh, okay, so if no more questions, then I will go to the uh, second part uh, that is about exploratory testing and how. Uh, the view I have is exploratory testing, and this may be something, it's not new, but it's something that. It's not how I see it uh, explained usually. Uh, is that exploratory testing will happen all the time, even when you have you know, some different places that have only automated tests and only scripted tests. There is, there is a, 
exploration happening because there are bugs and someone has to isolate the bug or investigate the bug in order to write it into the, the <laughs> whatever you write the bugs. And uh, you have tests happening on disposable time. You have tests happening before you automate, so you know how to automate this thing. You have tests happening when you're writing a test case and a test plan, just thinking about uh, what you have to write, even if the product is not there, just bringing these questions of what you want to write in this test plan, it's all part of exploration. And uh, when you have a bug reproduction from somewhere uh, on the community report, when you have to reproduce it and try it because it's not happening, that's all exploration. So you cannot do that without like, thinking it beforehand if you're not trying at the same time and thinking and redesigning the, the, the next step you'll take uh, at this very time. Uh, so when, when I uh, I am a big promoter and uh, advocate of exploratory testing at, at Intel, for example, in other places, but what I advocate is not to let's start doing our exploratory testing. Uh, first, because then people are afraid of changing, want to start something new that's not couldn't be any good, and second, because people don't notice that there is already a lot of exploratory testing going on, and we are just not taking full advantage of that. So you may have places where a tester is running over a set of test cases that they haven't had to run. Maybe part of them are automated, and he is working alone. And at the end of the day, he only reports the results of like, pass or fail that, that those tests. And no one noticed that during the day, before he started, after he finished, and during his test, he was doing a lot of exploration. Just no one was talking with him about that. And he wasn't telling that to anyone. And because it's it's like agreed by any, by everyone that this is just part of the things that we do in a hidden way, and no one takes benefit from that. And and everybody loses in this case. So uh, a test lead do not get the feeling of what problems and obstacles the test had, the tester had during his test. Uh, the tester, especially if he's new, he has no one to teach him uh, how to do better at this exploration, how he can try the bug isolation better the next time. And the managers are missing uh, a feeling of the tools of how hard is it really to solve this problem, this problem because testers are just working their own problems because they already know how to. So uh, so, uh, so I advocate that in every place already has a whole bunch of exploratory testing that no one needs to modify or add to. We just need to be aware and, and start working taking benefit of that. So, um, let's see. I wish I had more things written here. No, uh, I haven't written yet. <laughs> but uh, uh, the thing is uh, like that. We, we have uh, people wanting information. They just are not sure what kind of information they, they want. So all they know is uh, a fixed number of test results and pass and fails. We have testers that want to learn how to do exploration method because that's the part that's, that, that's really challenging. And no one is helping them to do that. And we have a test that is running between these two uh, parts of the, like, they, they have to bring numbers very quick to the management and they have to just help the testers go over the problem so they can run the next thing. And all this information and learning that is two-way is being missed. Uh, a test can benefit a lot if he just listens to, uh, instead of just listening what, uh, okay, a tester f finds a bug, uh, number 1344, and instead of just looking what's the bug and how is this severity, asking how did you find a, the bug, how did you isolate the bug, what else did you try, brings so much more information about the system than the, than the bug by itself. So all this exploration is just lost. And th that's what, what I mean when I say that there is a lot of Going on. We just need uh, champions or someone that starts working with people to get the information and maybe having, having it documented or just passing around different people inside the team or outside the team. Uh, it's, it's more uh, a problem of awareness uh, and being willing to, to work with it than a problem of changing the way we work now. Uh, yeah, that's a good thing. So, These are, you can see here some words, uh, uh, result, interpretation, continuous here, 
these are all uh, very powerful words in my view that uh, determine how uh, how a, a person works and actually what a person is when he works and the, the kind of thinking that he does and the kind of uh, interaction he has with other people in his team. That uh, it is usually what we expect of anyone uh, when we hire them, uh, unless uh, especially if we are trying to hire less. And we are looking for people that will have responsibility and learning and will know how to interpret, interpret results instead of just reporting them and being engaged and everything. And these are all parts of uh, the big, maybe the most detailed uh, description of what exploratory testing is. And so I don't want to enter here in the description of what exactly exploratory testing is, uh, although I, I could if you have questions, but I just I like to emphasize that exploratory testing is is a lot of uh, personal characteristics going on, and it's a lot of uh, uh, the way the team works and the dynamics between different teams and the, the things that management expects from people. So it, it's much more about about the people and, and the way we work with them than about uh, a tool we use uh, unless it's my tool, and more about and much more about people than about the technique that we will use or how we report things. It's, it's, it's the way people feel at, at work. So if we, if we give them freedom and we give them responsibility, they will have, you will have exploratory testing. And you will have good exploratory testing if you take advantage of that things. Uh, you know, other descriptions are shorter, but they don't have these nice points. And uh, Ken Kenner does a very good job of, of, of putting in important stuff in his definitions. So, this is maybe, and I just, I'm bringing this because I don't like this. This may be the biggest question that I have when I talk about sport tests, both at Intel and inside. Yeah, is that the idea that, okay, yeah, sport testing is great, and we uh, will work with people that already do sport testing, but we need the best testers to do that. I will work on the sport testers of the very uh, experienced people and the very knowledgeable, because they will do great sport testing. And and that's just not true. I, we, we, we cannot just wait for someone to become great and experienced just because he's been five years of Ozima. The, the way to, for this person to become experienced at the second year is to work with him all the time and to see uh, where, he does he, where he gets stuck and help him to get unstuck and what kinds of things he thinks and add, add to him what, uh, more two things to think about. And after you do that over and over again, then you don't need for someone to be a long, long time to be experienced, you become experienced automatically. You don't have like quick feedback is the best is the only way we evolve. Like even, even with kids, like, you can't wait for your kid to learn to speak alone, and he will just by listening to TV. But if you give feedback when he says he says mama, and say no, no mama, it's papa. So he learns to, to speak papa first. So uh, this, this quick feedback is what makes people evolve. They can evolve alone. Just let them see and they will, they will be in the community and they will be listening to things and they will become great, but it will take a lot of time. And you don't need that. You can work with people if you have good people to work with them. So anyone can be an exploratory testing and they will, they will be doing as a good job as this uh, lead or mentee or mentor can be to them. Uh, and, and that's why the hardest part to start working with exploratory testing is it's not on the testers, but it's usually more to the side of management or peers around. And managers are not sure what kind of information they can receive, and they get confused when you say, okay, we'll now explore and try to find the information that we want. What information do you want? And they have no idea. They, you know, I want numbers. And so, and, and that's the hard part. The testers are doing this product testing anyway, and if you work with them, you'll just be happier. The, the hard works come from the Managers, when they start to receive, together with the numbers they receive until now, a lot of stories about what people feel about the product, because that's what quality is. Like, uh, if if you talk with someone that's not here and you ask your mother how she likes the new uh, dishwasher, uh, and you will not receive an answer that say, "Oh yeah, it has three bugs and two of them are very high severity." She'll tell a story. Oh, it's good, but it's a little bit noisy sometimes, but only if I put too much things inside. So, quality are feelings and a story. Managers don't get that unless there's someone listening to the testers about what their feelings are 
and bringing that to management back. So, uh, and that's the hard part. Because testers are just eager to tell someone their, their feelings. And test managers are not used to listen to that, to that feeling, because no one has ever told them that that's an option. Mike, you can disagree. Not you. So, I think this is my last slide before I just show my tool that's very small. And uh, this is an idea of uh, how to make this exploration and the quick feedback work in a very easy way. It's, uh, it was called uh, session-based test management. Uh, uh, a friend uh, of mine from the Netherlands started to use it the other way around, and it works much better. And when you put management at the front of the trace, it sounds much more safe for managers. Okay, someone is managing this set of plus this session based thing. So it, it, is, it, is good, it is a good way to manage tests based on sessions. And sessions are nothing else than uh, uninterrupted time uh, testing uh, activity. So a tester goes, he works for two hours, uh, usually it's uh, one hour and a half, two hours, doing whatever he wants to do, or even if it's following a script, uh, or running the automation. And after that, someone sits at him for 15 minutes to half an hour and speak about that time and try to see what else was there apart from the uh, list of pests and fails. Uh, that's all there is to session-based test management. So uh, there are a lot other things like adding a charter so the tester knows what's the, uh, the path that he has to follow when he tests and the types of things we are looking at at this time. And the tester takes notes, but it's a, the most important part of the session and brings results back to our reviewer. Now, on this debrief, so everybody is learning. That's the first time that the tester has someone to tell him how to use testing techniques while he tests. Instead of we having... And it happens. Sure, not here or in my company, but in other companies in Silicon Valley, it happens that the testers, they are doing tests, uh, following some idea that someone else wrote, so they're not using the techniques as they test until they are four years in the company. Then they start writing test cases for other people using techniques. So no one is never using the techniques as they test. They're just using the techniques when they write. And so when you review the, a, a two-hour session of someone, and, and he said, OK, I tried these and these and these, and you can tell him, oh, we have a different we, we can try to divide these in, in an our ways way and teach him how to take the data that he just got from the software to divide parallels and try the, uh, the next thing, then people are learning to use techniques as they test. And then by the time they write the test cases, they will be much better at that because they try that freely. And so the tester is learning and the lead is learning what problems are there. So usually we are looking for obstacles that the tester got and uh, uh, overall feelings and a uh, list of bugs, but much more uh, quality information than what we get when you, you just get a number of, okay, I had three bugs out of the seven tests that I tried. So it, it's all about having quick feedback and very quick, uh, it's, it's a very good for uh, course correction too. So it, it's very, it can be uh, scary to tell, okay, I'll leave my testers to do exploratory testing for the next three months and I'll come back later and see what happened during three, this three months. Maybe they did something wrong. But when you have two hours and you can correct the course at that time, then it's okay, no big risk, right? Maximum, they learned something that wasn't, they weren't supposed to learn now, they learned now, should happen and later, but you, you miss one morning, not more than that. And everybody is still benefiting from that. Uh, so that's an idea of session base. Uh, we could give a, a whole talk on, uh, on session base, and there are talks like that, but it's not a, a complex thing. You can read on the internet, it's, it's enough. But for the review and for accountability of what has been tested, that, uh, another fear of the testing. Okay, so what did you do? If you don't have test cases, how do you take, take, uh, keep track of what did you do? The, the notes are maybe the most important part of the testing. So you can have uh, bad charters and not do a good debrief, but the notes are the things that will help you to have a good debrief and to be accountable for what you did. Uh, and, and for these notes, uh, is what where Rapid Reporter was intended. So 
I will show it's it's a short demo. I will show the demo unless you have questions about it for the testing and session based. I was so clear. Okay. Actually, well, one thing I <laughs> you, you may have mentioned it. If so, I apologize for asking you to repeat yourself. What exactly was the charter? The charter is it's not an objective, but it's it's a, a path to follow. It's like uh, test the or, or can be an area like test the open file that um, command in the menu. Okay, and that can take three sessions of one hour and a half. Uh, it can be a uh, uh, like test the menus in different resolutions. So it's, it can be an area or a type of test, like something that will focus instead of okay, go wild on, this, on, the, on the software. That it can happen, but it's usually it helps. I mean, that could be your charter, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and and you usually start with the charter that is just a reconnaissance charter. Okay, take the software and start playing with it. Maybe your notes of what the software, what's everything that exists in the software. So the tester will try those different things. But after you have this like reconnaissance mm -hmm. chart, you have a list of areas that you want to cover until the project ends. So it's useful to 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 try to set up. Okay, now work on this area. The next time you work on the other. The tester is entitled to 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 go an opportunity time and try off chart these things if he is feeling that something interesting there. And it's fine because you can correct that at the next session. So, so he can come and tell, come and tell, okay, I, this thing was weird. I, I thought I could crash, so I wrote it two hours and I managed to crash. And you'll be happy that he tried something else. But if he didn't manage to crash, you can say, okay, stop trying to crash it. I will take a note for this for the next charter someone because this week we want to finish the menu parts. Cool. Thank you. So uh, we have to finish at four and a half. You're doing fine. Okay. I think people leave us Okay, thank you. So, a short history of our proposal. We, uh, well, as I told, we always did exploratory testing because everyone is doing it even when they don't know. Uh, but uh, when I moved to a small team uh, where I thought I had, and I really did have enough autonomy uh, to try things different, I wanted to do like, most pure exploratory testing uh, as we could. So. We did not work on test cases of test plan before. Uh, we, we talked with the programmer, with the managers, and with the people that were the customer of this tool to get their expectations out of the tool and we build a big uh, mind map of what you know the tool knows to do. And that was all we had there, the mind map. And when we started working, then we noticed that uh, this product works on, on a different set of operations, so we had the mind map and a table of what are all the functions of this of the software. That's all we had, and we, according to the mind map, we defined the areas for the chargers. Uh, this was the first time that I was working on 100% session-based testing with exploration. Uh, some of the testers were more uh, experienced than others. Some of them was, it was the first time they were doing an exploratory testing in an official way, and they were even scared. What does that mean that I can decide what to do next? That we are not used to that. Uh, so the notes are very important to me because I wanted to sit with everyone at the end of the session and talk and, and learn what they learned and, and teach them whatever I can. And so the notes were the one, more, most important parts. And I, to make them flexible, we started by handwriting on a notebook, uh, not a notebook, that's like on paper. And it was good for the notes, but it was a mess to manage and I had to work after hours to put try to put that on the computer in a way that we can search later and it was not so good. So we moved to Notepad. And it was it wasn't still so good. We moved to and then it was maybe the only one uh, session based note taking software called session tester. Uh, and we worked with this for a while but uh, notes weren't so good because it was hard to take notes. A session tester is big, it has like, all the theory of session based test management is on the tool, you have menus and you have to Talk, to think about how you are organizing your notes. That made the notes to come slowly and usually small and weak. Uh, and, and the testers are not happy that it was hard, but the overall idea is that it's hard, but it's work, so that's what we do. And, and this type of thinking really hurts. So 
after one time that we had a talk about that uh, on the way home to the bus I started drawing how should the ultimate note taking tool look for writing. And I came up up to something very, very small that uh, it's like uh, like a flip camera where you press a button and start, press a button and stop. That's all my tool did. And the first version of it had three hundred lines of code and now it's uh, Ugly and the second goal is uh, seven and but it's still very simple. But suddenly, many many teams all over the world started to take it, and I, there are no people using it in Japan, in the, in the Netherlands, in the United States, uh, in Brazil, in, in Israel. It, it, it is so easy to use, and because it's small, the testers are already using it. Uh, I got uh, permission from Intel to release it as a tool of mine open source because I worked the other after hours for it. And this is all the tool. So the, the first feature is that it's yellow. The second feature is that it's always on top. And, and these were really the first two things that I decided even before I knew what I wanted the tool to do. I wanted it to be yellow and always on top. So testers can just switch to it and write without having to, to look for it. I think, hey, where is the note taking to? And it was here somewhere and start all having to find it. So it's it's always there. So if you are testing that mm, that's it. So I use the internet spark. It does that thing I have five so. yeah. Don't be better? Don't be mad. <laughs> oh I you on your updates every day. <laughs> Who tests this thing? I don't <laughs> <laughs> That's because the Wi-Fi is so bad. Okay. It's here. Fine. Oh, red. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's say I'm, I'm testing a, a Firefox now. And, and so that's my tool. It's the other one is all on top. So even when you're working with Firefox, you know that the tool is there. And it's, whenever you put it, it will be there. Like, you, you don't need to, to think about where he is. So you, you don't lose testing cycles from that. So if you're um, here and you want, want to write something, you just go to it and go for it. And start writing. So to do... Can I tell this? Yeah, great. Automation. Uh, the tool lets you choose what you want to, uh, to save the results of your testing. Safe in a Mozilla place. And so, so I am, let's say, let's say I write my name, I write uh, my testing is a demo. Mozilla. After these two things, uh, the tool started to work. And all you see is, is all the tool goes in its basic, uh, in its basic configuration. So you can start to write here in your setup, Windows 64, 764, whatever you write. And you press enter, it's logged, it's saved every time, so if it crashes, you don't lose your information. And when you write something just by pressing up and down, even while they write, you change the type of flow you're taking. So if now you are reporting a bug, or you are asking a question, or you are just suggesting something for the next session you or another tester will do, and if you just change it by, by by pressing up and down. So the tool is organizing now all the nodes behind your back. Even if in, or like if, if there are many people that use one node and then you just you have to go to the area that you want. Well oh, this is an idea, this is a bug. This is. Because you can just tell the tool what's the type of node you're taking, it takes uh, care of that for you. Uh, can you show the, the report real quick? Because I have to I'd like to see your report that comes out. Or, I mean, I'm assuming there's a... Yes, I have one prepared, uh, because I did a demo of this at Stars. And it saves everything in common separate value. Because then you can let Excel, you can manipulate everything on Excel. So I will show two things that it has. So you can have it in a common separate value where everything is 
time sample as you see. So with all the different nodes, so the best I can take. Oh, so this is a node, this is a, something for the next time, or oh, there's a file history, so maybe it's tracking the registry, someone has to test that. And you will not be here, but they will see how a tester can take screenshots and send the nodes all the time. So every node can have, uh, let's take the zoom out, please. So every node has or not an attachment. You see at the, at the end of the screenshot. And before you leave, this can be transformed in an HTML uh, uh, report, so managers can understand them easily. And see, okay, this is the node, this is the screenshot, this is the bank, it's red. And so with this, you can review a two hour sessions in 20 minutes very quickly. I like it. Thanks a lot. I like it too. <laughs> So now everybody's curious about uh, the screenshots. Uh, before the screenshots, I want you to pay attention to Let's talk about screenshots before. No, okay, no, let's talk about this. Uh, the default time is 90 minutes of a session. You can have uh, smaller sessions like 60, or you can just not have a timer at all. Uh, what happens when you have a timer is that you see here behind the I don't have a progress bar going on. It will reach the end, uh, now 60 minutes from now, because that's all I wrote. It will not stop after the portal from working, so the tester can stop before the time or after the time, but it helps him to see, okay, I'm towards the end, so I may want to come back to the chart very well. It helps the tester to decide what the next action, action to do. It doesn't mandate any action on the tester, so it doesn't start buzzing. A small icon appears on the corner, but without bothering the so the idea is to have something that is never obtrusive to the tester's uh, thinking cycle. The, thinking, the tester is thinking about the test. And he just writes one note at a time. As you can see, the, there's not a list of notes here. So the tester does not need to think about how he organizes notes. He cannot even see them. He can, however, uh, if he presses with the right click here, choose a previous note just if he wants to make something very similar. But he cannot go and change, which is a good thing because uh, when the tester, and that happens to me too, sometimes I write something in my note that is a bug, and 15 minutes later I discover it's not a bug. I'll just delete that or fix whatever I wrote. But then that confusion is lost. So when you, as a test leader, are talking to the tester and you don't notice that he got confused for 15 minutes, you miss a lot of conversation there. So here this conversation happens because he will have a note that writes that the sales bad KGA, yes, that they say something is a bad, and later he will say, I know though that was not a bad, that was something else. And then you can talk about the confusion because if he got confused, something is wrong there. So so the tester do not think about whatever he already wrote. Everything that's written will, will come up on the, the discussion. If something is very terrible, like he wrote uh, some course or some profanation, he can always open and, and change the, the comma separated value or a notepad and it, 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 it works like uh, the tool does not lock it for anything. It's, but it's not part of the use of the tool to change these things. Uh, now the other, uh, there are other three things in the GUI that are cute. Uh, there's a transparency in case the tester just still wants to see the whole screen. I only know about one team in England using that. But People like it. And the, the, the two important things that are left here in the GUI is the option to write a more than one line note. Uh, it helps because then you can, add a, you can copy a log file, you can copy a whole text of a page, you can copy uh, um, an error message. It's uh, also. Uh, it's a rich text, so it's flexible. And you hit save, and you can see the button change a little bit. This next node will have this as an attachment. The same thing happens when you press here. It takes, now you didn't even notice it took a screenshot of the whole picture. If you don't want a screenshot of the whole picture, you press with shift, and it's, it opens here so you can select the only area you want, and drop, and save, and that's the attachment you have. 
so you can see these the attachments we took now here, right? This is the screenshot, this is the screenshot of the part, this is the, the extended node, all appears in the comma separated file um, that you can open in Excel. So you can follow it, that's it, okay, this was uh, your setup, and you put this as a node for the next time, and then you have this uh, node with a screenshot and an extended node, let's look at it. Uh, if you don't want from here, you can look at it from the HTML and it's just a link that you press and you see it. Well, like here, here it was. Let's close this. Ah, that's all. It sounds all, not mine. So, this is a, a, a session I did with, with a friend there uh, at uh, Stylist. I, I knew I would have not had time to make a full session here thinking with you, but. But you can see, we are testing Freemind, another open source uh, product. And we noticed that uh, it opens with the last midnight identity, even in the dashboard version, so there is something with registry here, and this is the special that we saw in the last, uh, the last file opening, and we had one test, okay, what happens uh, if a file is already open? And there was no bug here, the file opened, but then it's always it opening together. So, so if you read the notes and you see the screenshots, you get a lot of information. You want to see the extended notes. In this case, was are you okay? These are the two folders. Mindmap was looking for information on the on uh, free mind was using for information on the mind maps. So this is a, an extended node attached to a simple node that says that says that there is an obscure folder where free mind is accessing. And I just added the name of the folder to that part. Uh, all these, as you can see, happen during uh, 25 minutes of testing uh, with someone else. We just wrote down uh, everything, that, like the things that we talk with one to each other, questions, what happened, no, look at this. We just wrote them down on, on Rapid Report, and Rapid Report organized that for you. The, the good thing is that because it's on, on a common separate player, you can use your spreadsheet of choice to manipulate it. You can just look at, uh, at bugs and say, okay, these are the two bugs from the session. You can consolidate uh, four sessions and look only at the list of bugs or only at the list of questions. And then on, the next, on your next meeting with the product manager, you just take the list of questions and say, okay, we were thinking about these things. How do you answer them? In a very easy way. Uh, and that's uh, all the visual part of uh, Rapid Reporter. Rapid Reporter has, um, has more, has another uh, testing that has some accelerators for uh, advanced users. And it's written in .NET, Microsoft, but it's So I don't know if you can see, I believe you can. Yeah, it's big. It has these accelerators that help. It has an accelerator to transform any common separated value from an off rapid reporter into an HTML page, the same one you saw. And it has also uh, an accelerator to take many common separated value files. You have sessions from different team members from different days, and it takes all of them and just concatenate one after the other in one big report file, so you can have all your uh, all the sessions from, from your product in one file that you can then from to HTML to. This HTML I didn't sh show you, but it it can be uh, stylized with a with a regular style sheet, so you can put the Mozilla logo and so other people use that because they give consultancy services to other companies, so they can like, build a real report of the company logo and colors. So, and, and when you have this whole report, you can use uh, your spreadsheet to count uh, how many bugs were found per session, how many time of testing was all along. Uh, you can start looking at, okay, most of our time we were dealing with the setup or dealing with uh, bug investigations. And 
And the next part, and this is nice, uh, it's several semantic proposals, is that the two rapid reporting blocks have anything you write as loss types. So, uh, for example, some of the people that use rapid reporter in the Netherlands, they don't use English, so they instead of, they don't write this question load because it's English and they like other languages. So they just write here other things like uh, this is load in, in Dutch and drag is this question. But every single value comes from them. So I started to learn another. So this is Let's say we use defect for bad, something like that. When you open up a deporter like this, you will just have your own set of, of types. And that helps because many companies have their own names, so they don't say bad, they say defect, they say issue. And they're very particular about that, to the point that people are fighting. So every company can just add things. If you don't like to have a note for a checks and for tests, then you remove one of them and use only the ones you use. And, and that makes Rapid Deporter very uh, uh, versatile and flexible. I'll, I'll show you another thing that I haven't planned, but it's nice. I listened to a webinar by uh, Guy Kawasaki, you know him? The Apple guy? Apple. Yeah. So I listened to the webinar, and all the while I was with Rapid Deporter open and uh, recording things he said. Because I, I can take screenshots. I took screenshots of the webinar, and so I have the whole webinar here with uh, his code, so I, I, I changed the types of the notes to be lecture, code, uh, probably I have something like question. I may have, no, I don't have questions, but I, I, don't, I don't notice them. Yeah, so I have something that is question, so at the end of this webinar when it has, someone has questions, I could go back and look at my questions to maybe if I wanted to ask. Uh, so I, I, there is a, a, a guy, a Jay, but I'm not that using up the reporter to take notes during meetings. So he writes the name of a different person, and he takes notes of all the brainstorming that's going on. It's going to say what? It, it may be uh, like a very flexible tool to take notes overall. And so we use this on um, weekend testing uh, uh, to take notes and just send one to the other very easily. And that's all it's got. Uh, it, it's got more than that, because uh, it's been growing with requests. I try to fix bugs. This is the open source part. Uh, it's open source. I can show you my... Maybe the online. What? Ah, no, I'm not online. Yes, wireless. Access code. I can fire a for the capital one. <laughs> I see it on your shirt. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, let's, I use fossil uh, version control. I don't know if you know, you know it. It's great. That's, I really like it. Uh, that's one of the check-ins the best 2000 entries. I'm the only, the, the only programmer on that, so it's a, it's a very linear uh, check-in and check-out process. Okay? I just add to it. Sometimes I experiment with something and, and drop it and we'll add it later. But uh, it's on the web, so anyone can take a snapshot of things I, I do or I try at any given moment. No one knows. Uh, but I don't care. I, I like, like people complaining on bugs. I like that a lot. Uh, I try to fix bugs as quickly as possible. I try to add features as slowly as possible. Uh, things lose uh, severity as the time goes by. So after you, you have a bug for two months, you start thinking, oh, it's not so important, I can work around it. And then I may risk not to put it in. On the, but that's what I want to have in its features. Because I, it is a good tool because it doesn't do anything other than what I showed you. Right? If I start adding people say, oh, why don't you add a dialogue that does that, and a menu, and I have no dialogue philosophy. I, apart from this uh, exception dialogue, there are no dialogues on, on the table. And there are no menus just to make it real simple. Uh, so it, it's on the web. The tool uh, was not public for almost the whole of uh, 2010, because uh, we are 
I am paranoid uh, working at Intel because they are paranoid too. So I wanted to make sure that they would not mind me publishing things uh, open source on the, on the internet until I got permission. So at the end of 2010, it got uh, out. It's maybe seven months out, something like that. I have at least uh, 20 different companies that are uh, sending me problems all the time, <laughs> which is good. I, I mean, someone is saying bye to me. There aren't any bugs if there's no end. And I learned that in one of my first years at Intel. There was this big uh, internal testing guru called Guy. I, I, I liked him very much. And, and we were talking about bugs, and I said to him someday, well, it's, yeah, but every software has bugs, right? This is the way we think. There is no software without bugs. And then he told me, what if the, if the software has no users? If a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to listen, does make sound? And it was a big, like, insightful moment for, for me, because if no one sees any value at all in software, and no one is using it, then there are no bugs. I believe that Windows 3.1 has no bugs nowadays. Right? Perfect problem, perfect software. It's not bugging anyone. So, so, so in these seven months, there are companies, uh, smaller and bigger, that are using it uh, over, around the world. It's, it's not, I don't make any money out of it. And I have I had written like, commercial software before that. So, but still, these are the most rewarding 700 lines of code that I've ever written. Uh, just because it's, it's, it's something that is useful. It started like, scratching my personal itch, and then I noticed that it's, it's useful for much, uh, many other people. Uh, so, I am, uh, I would, if you start using it, I would be happy to listen uh, about the problems you have and try to fix them. And about features you have, I, I consider it all of them, I just don't always add the features here. And you are open source guys, so you can start fixing bugs for me too. I don't need to do that alone. Uh, I have a ticketing system here where. So these are the tickets open nowadays. Not so much. It's a simple software, useful tool, I think so. It helps, as I said, for that, the tool, I just think that, uh, where was it there? I just think that reviewing, like reviewing, this was a, a 35, 40 minute session that can be reviewed within, within five to 10 minutes with a tester in a very good level of detail of what was the cognitive process the testing was having during this uh, half an hour. And it works as the same thing after two hours of tests. You can just know. And it's all text files, so they are searchable with your Google search or your Windows search. Whenever someone says, oh, what kind of tests did you run on the file open menu? You just search on this folder for file open, and you'll see all the things you try in all the different sessions. So it's comfortable. I want to open up the questions, if people have questions. Sure, we have to close soon. Well, I People may have. There was one question online. Um, this is very simple. It's almost uh, too simple. Um, the back of your laptop. Yeah. Where did you get that? So, okay, thank you. This position is good. Let's talk about the laptop because I like that too. Uh, I, I just uh, stood here. These are three levels of different type of stickers, and it's it's now a whiteboard. It's also a clipboard. So it's <laughs> so it's like my low tech uh, laptop. I, it's the ultimate note taking device. I can take notes whichever way I want. Uh, I, I did not buy it anywhere. I, I can uh, look at uh, or show someone here. I have a, a laptop sticker that will not leave uh, stains on the laptop, and then I have a, a blank uh, uh, white, uh, like the like ones you use to protect uh, notebooks at school. Mm -hmm. And then I have a, a glass sticker on top of that. So it became a white. Thank you for your question, anonymous internet user. I will do uh, some instructables uh, with all the steps. I have pictures. So, have you had um, 
But it sounds like you've had some success with other companies adopting Rapid Reporter. Have you have you heard um, about any of those companies using it in conjunction with with um, anything else, or have they have they wanted to take the data from the common delimited file and and do something else with it? Yeah, yeah it's a good point. I have. Although I had never went to a company to talk about the importance of the first time it happened, I do, and I am now officially a vendor of a testing software. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there are other companies using it. They don't use Rapid Reporter to report bugs. They use Rapid Reporter to take notes of bugs. So they use Rapid Reporter, then then Godzilla or Mantis or Orando they use to log bugs. Uh, I know that I got a request to make a feature to log uh, uh, bugs directly from Rapid Reporter into Jira, for example. So I know there are people using this to take notes and Jira to log bugs, and that's the way I think it should be. I, I haven't added this feature yet. I think it just will be too complicated and not give so much value. Uh, but but maybe it could be valuable. I don't know. So it's only for note taking. It's not for bug reporting. It's not for uh, time management. Uh, it's not for requirements management. Just to have an accountable record of the test done. Good enough? Is the internet silent? Hardly. <laughs> yeah, there aren't any. Well, I want to read the transcript of the IRC. Are there many people there? Uh, there's a few. Hi, internet. The real world <laughs> says hello. <laughs> Okay, so I don't know if there are no other questions, I guess we can close. Thank you. Thanks.